Welcome to BioCentury This Week, the podcast with BioCentury's editorial team talking about the latest in the world of biotech. I'm Jeff Cranmer, one of the executive editors here at BioCentury, and joining me today are my colleagues... Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Selena Koch, Executive Editor. Steve Austin, Washington Editor. And Stephen Hansen, Director of Biopharma Intelligence. On today's podcast, we'll talk about BMS and its impending patent cliff, how the company plans to navigate it. We have some more biotech IPOs to talk about, and bills in Congress are taking aim at Chinese biotechs, what's behind the legislation. And we'll wrap up taking a look at our colleague Danielle Golovin's deep dive into the innovation behind last year's biotechs raising Series A rounds. All right, Stephen, we just had BMS put out its financial results uh, late last week, and you are digging into what's happening with the company's pipeline and it's uh, marketed drugs. How's it looking? <laughs> um, I think challenging is probably the best word, Jeff, that I would start with. I mean, so just very quickly to try and give you a sense of the challenge that BMS faces for their 2023 earnings of the top nine selling drugs that they had this year, eight of those are facing a potential loss of exclusivity by 2028. And those eight account for nearly 90%, which is about $39.5 billion of their 2023 sales. Seven of those face a loss of exclusivity by 2026, and those account for nearly 70% of BMS's sales. Now, just to give a little bit of context for those numbers, in 2019, about three years before Humira sales peaked, uh, Humira revenues accounted for about 59% of AbbVie's total peak sales. So, you know, it looks like this 2026 cliff is an even bigger hole for BMS than the one that AbbVie faced with the loss of exclusivity for Humira. Now, obviously, this is front and center <laughs> for the company and for investors, even noted by, you know, if you listen to their uh, call with analysts and investors on Friday, uh, new CEO Christopher Borner basically took the opportunity to address BMS's strategy. That was the first thing he talked about on the call. Um, you know, and he's really framing it as them sort of coming up on three distinct periods for the company. There's sort of the near-term growth until there's that initial loss of exclusivity. Then there is what they're referring to as a transition period. And then a return to growth is what they're what they're predicting, what they're aiming for by as early as 2028. You know, but looking at the newly launched products, looking at the MA in the pipeline, um, as Borner himself said, he said, we have to execute exquisitely well. And I think that's probably what it's going to take for them to uh, to meet some of those meet some of those markers that they set out. So let's, you know, think about this. Obviously, you know, what we're hearing is BMS has got a challenging few years, and I don't think that it sounds like they uh, have their head in the sand on that. You know, you have this transition period. On the plus side, let's talk about a, a few aspects of their history that speak well for them, and then maybe you can talk a little bit about the pipeline. So, you know, let's acknowledge historically, I mean, BMS, they were really pioneers in immuno-oncology and they took some very big risks there. You know, they kept going when others might have walked away. They understood that the nature of clinical trials was different in that indication. And so they came out, obviously, with Opdivo. And as I know you're going to point out in the story, that sort of really got surpassed by Merck's Keytruda. So, you know, you've got this first in class, you've got to be first in class and best in class. But that aside, BMS does have a culture and a history of doing very forward thinking science. We've spoken with their CSO, Robert Plenge, recently. You know, they've got some very innovative things early in the pipeline. And so that sort of speaks well to the to the bones of BMS and mm -hmm. to to their ability to do science that really translates to powerful products. So I'm not on their pay, um, <laughs> on their payroll, I should, I should emphasize, but I feel like we just sort of want to be, want to be clear that, you know, there's a lot going on in a huge company like that. Maybe you can point to, if you were inside BMS or running the show, whatever, 
you know, what are the standout things in their pipeline on which they're going to be hanging their hat? And obviously they have to execute, but what are the sort of highlights you think that if they execute well, could pull them out of this? Sure. Yeah, no. And I, I think you're absolutely, it's a perfectly fair point you make in terms of their long-term future. I think they've got a lot of really interesting, uh, you know, they have their own internal protein degrader platform. They've got the radio farmer platform they just acquired from Raise Bio amongst several other things. So, I mean, I think, you know, they're doing ADCs as well. So you can definitely see where the future is going for BMS and that it's bright, but those are probably more 2030s type of products that are going to be coming. Um, in, in the current pipeline, I mean, th there's still, you know, th there are some really good programs that they've recently launched that are doing well. For instance, Camzios, Mavicampton for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been off to a good launch, you know, and I think that there's opportunity for them to expand there. A couple other pods, I mean, Optualag, you know, that they're, you know, BMS is one of the few companies, right, that have hit on another checkpoint uh, inhibitor, and they've got Optualag, which is an early launch, which looks to be going well. And then Brazani, which is their CD19 targeted uh, CAR T, you know, I think that looks poised to really potentially expand and, and challenge what Gilead has in CAR Ts because they've got three Pudufa dates that are coming up this year, one in CLL, which could potentially make them the only CD19 CAR T therapy in CLL where others have failed. So there's opportunities there, but I think the the challenge that that BMS's pipeline faces in, is in a lot of these programs. It's either an incredibly competitive space where there is quickly coming other competition that at least early on potentially looks like it could have efficacy benefits. Just for instance, we, we just, I just mentioned Camzios. Um, we obviously saw in December data from Cytokinetics for Afficampton. There are some that are arguing that that could potentially be best in class and beat out Camzios. Now it kind of, you know, the question is, you know, Will it be cytokinetics that would be commercializing it? Will there be someone else commercializing it? Um, you know, so that's that's an instance there. So tick two, which is you know Bristol's first in class tick two inhibitor, had great data when it when it first launched. You know, when it came out, beating Otesla in psoriasis. But now we've seen that Takeda acquired from Nimbus for four billion dollars a tick two that, on face value, looks like it has better data. There are oral therapies coming for other immunology targets in psoriasis like IL-23 that potentially have better efficacy. So a lot of these newly launched products are coming up in very competitive spaces where it's hard, I think, to say that what they've got is definitely going to be best in class. See that theme also in their CAR Ts, right? They were, again, an area where they were first in class with their BCMA CAR T, then comes legend. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Yeah, I think that was sort of another, besides Updevo getting getting nipped by Keytruda, their Absema, their BCMA CAR T, which they're partnered with 270 Bio on, was first in class, was doing well. And then Carvicti came in and seems to be kind of wiping the floor in the BCMA space right now. You know, I, I think one of the biggest sort of X factors, and pardon the pun here, uh, for, for Bristol Myers will be their factor 11A inhibitor, Milvexian which they are really posing as being potential, you know, basically the, the, the follow-on for Eliquis and this cardiovascular blockbuster that essentially combines the best of both antiplatelet agents and, um, you know, a factor 10A inhibitor. But one of the competitors, Bayer, had a negative outcome in a phase three trial just uh, a couple of months ago. So that raises questions about the class, you know, is this a class that's going to work? And so, you know, I think sort of investments like that and programs like that that kind of have to be executed on have to deliver for BMS to be able to kind of hit the targets that they're sort of presenting for for investors. I think we can't close out a discussion of BMS without mentioning another bright spot, which is their Karuna acquisition. So what what's the potential there True. to help fill this no, hole? No, no, that's a good call out, Selena. That's so, you know, as we've talked about, I think we've talked about this on one of the prior podcasts about the $14 billion acquisition of Karuna. Um, I think they're rightfully so sort of putting that as being a potential multi-billion dollar blockbuster for the company um, going forward. It's a schizophrenia drug that they're anticipating will get approved and they'll be launching by September. And, you know, they're thinking about, well, they, they are going to be expanding it into uh, psychosis and Alzheimer's disease, bipolar yeah, adjunctive treatment. I think that might be coming Adjunctive next. treatment as well. Thank and, you. And Thank quickly, you, I think those are underway, yeah? 
That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think they're in phase three for the Alzheimer's and for the adjunctive. So those could be coming on online quite quickly. So yeah, it's, you know, there's a lot happening there. There's, there's a lot to like, but I think there are going to be a lot of challenges that they need to deliver on. So last question then on this, Stephen, it sounds like there's, you know, a bunch of possibilities in their pipeline. And then, you know, what we've talked about here and we'll continue to talk about is for them and others is this question of first in class versus best in class. When you are first in class, there's always something of a gamble, right? Because you don't always know what's coming behind you. So as you look across their pipeline, is it a question that these all need to deliver or is it a question that they just need to have enough shots on goals to deliver in order to sort of recover a investor, a, a position that would keep investors uh, happy? I think it's a situation where most of these have to deliver. I think they need to deliver on a lot of these pipeline assets for them to be able to meet their goals. So, so for these newly launched drugs, they had sort of set this long-term target of basically growing them from about three and a half billion in sales now to 25 billion in sales by 2030. I mean, that's about a 30% annual growth rate over quite a long period. And while I'm sure some of those products will achieve that kind of a profile, getting it across the board, I think is maybe going to be more of more of the challenge. And so we'll see, but it's, it's uh, just in terms of what I can, what I can think of it just, cuts to me as being one of the one of the largest patent cliffs that I can recall seeing in, in a number of years. All right. Well, Stephen's story will be out this week. Look out for that. And Stephen, before we let you go, uh, another week, another pair of biotech IPOs, uh, neuropsychiatry company Alto and obesity play Fractal landed on NASDAQ. How did they fare? Yeah, so it was a bit more mixed this week, you know, after... Um, CG Oncology and Air Events, you know, got out the week prior and did very well. And what was great to see was that those are still holding their uh, aftermarket trading, you know, for both of them. So that's really encouraging to see. Alto kind of followed a similar path, you know, sort of had a first day bump and at least on the few days we've had so far seems to be holding. But um, Fractal is sort of the first, uh, maybe the first chink in the IPO armor for Biopharma this, uh, this year. I think it traded down uh, like 14 or 15 percent on the first day. Uh, it's trading down again today. So we'll see. I mean, it's you know, it's a different mix of uh, of investors. I think I don't think they had many specialist investors inside Fractal. So whether that is any sort of a driving force or not, um, we'll see. But, um, you know, it's also a bit of an interesting play. We commented on this before I said, you know, one of their programs is is a very early stage gene therapy for obesity, a GOP one delivery, and um, thought that was an, an interesting way to think about going about the problem. And then would be was going to be interested to see how investors reacted. And apparently, I think maybe there's maybe there's still a bit of skepticism, but uh, but we'll see. Looking at sort of the the broader, I know you've been writing uh, a lot about kind of the the broader sentiment for biotech and your. 2024 public markets preview story really kind of dug into what buy siders are thinking about interest rates. I, I was just curious after late last week, we saw job growth numbers that surprised economists. What do the uh, numbers say about the expectations for rate cuts and, and how will that affect biotech sentiment going into the year? Yeah, so I mean, I think you know what we've what we've kind of seen following that is the um, the ten year yield, Treasury yields have started to tick back up, and we saw last year that essentially the XBI traded at an inverse to the uh, to the Treasury yields, and so kind of seeing the XBI while it's been pretty much flat, you're starting to see it tick down a little bit. So I think basically what this means is that I think now people are basically saying that you're not going to be seeing a rate cut in March, although I personally never expected there to be a rate cut in March, but I'm also, you know, I only play an economist on the podcast, not, uh, not in real life. Um, so I think this pushes back, you know, the rate cuts and, you know, maybe there'll be more questions about whether we'll actually get three rate cuts this year or not, but it probably just means that biotech trades a little bit more flat until we get a bit more visibility on, on where interest rates are really going to go. And you, you get to be a, a economist on the podcast and not in real life, which means that 
you, you actually don't get celebrated for being wrong all the time. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, you you get to you get to keep your job, Stephen. Because if it was up to me, I'd fire all the pollsters and all the economists for being wrong every single month, every single time. And uh, yeah, so Jeff has had some. It's good to hear. Inbound from me, yeah. <laughs> Next, we'll be heading to Washington to get the latest from Steve. But first, this. This March, BioCentury, Bay Helix, and Insights partner, McKinsey & Company, bring the third East-West Biopharma Summit to Singapore, the gateway to Asia. At the summit, you will get a first-hand look at how the smart money pouring into Singapore plans to scale up the emerging life sciences ecosystem. You will also meet the key players from Asia's innovation arc, from India through Southeast Asia to China, Korea, and Japan. If you are a biopharma executive looking for partners or investors, or a life sciences investor looking for portfolio companies or limited partners, now is the time to meet Asia leaders face-to-face -face in Singapore. Register today at biocentryeastwest.com. All right. Well, hey, uh, let's turn to Washington now. Uh, there's, there's some bills in Congress that are taking aim at Chinese companies that manufacture equipment or provide services associated with the collection or analysis of genetic information. The biotechs named in this legislation, Wuxi Aptech, Wuxi Biologics, BGI and MGI, they deny the allegations in the legislation, but the companies have lost a total of 20 billion in value since the Biosecure Act was introduced in the House January 26th. Steve, what's behind these bills? Well, look, there's, there's broad bipartisan support for enhancing the competitiveness of US companies relative to Chinese industry across the board, and including in biotech, and restricting access of Chinese high-tech companies to US markets. Um, as you said, there's this, the Biosecure Act in the House, there's another bill in the Senate, which is quite similar, Senate Bill 3558, and it's likely that at some point those two are going to be combined and may be considered as a standalone bill or included in a defense appropriations bill. You know, BGI told me that the Biosecure Act would effectively drive it out of the U.S., and I think that's not an exaggeration, and I think it's an accurate representation of the intent of the bill's sponsors. They're being advised by the National Security Commission on Emerging Biotechnology, that's a congressionally chartered group that includes prominent people from the intelligence community, tech opinion leaders like former Google CEO Eric Schmidt, biotech folks like Jason Kelly, the CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks. You know, in a letter to congressional leaders, the commission cited the Chinese telecom company Huawei and said the U.S. should act to prohibit the use of certain Chinese biotech products and services before they become as embedded in the economy as Huawei did. So there's... There's really three things, I think, and they're intertwined that members of Congress and the commission and others who are kind of in the thought leaders who are advising Congress um, are concerned about. I'm not making judgments as to whether they're correct or not, but I think it's important to understand where they're coming from, what they're saying, okay? One is national security, another is commercial competitiveness, and a third is privacy. National security concerns centered around allegations that Chinese biotech companies have close ties to and bolster the Chinese military, the importance of biotech for America's economy, and the ways genomics information can be used in surveillance. Competitive claims, basically, the claims are that the Chinese companies aren't playing on a level playing field with American companies and European companies, that the Chinese government subsidizes national champions. There's a conviction among members of Congress and those who advise them that all Chinese companies are subject to the control of the Chinese Communist Party and that they're essentially fronts for the party and the state, that they're all um, intertwined. And then there's privacy concerns about the collection of, of, of sensitive data. And again, as you point out, the companies, the Chinese companies involved either deny or say that um, these charges are, are false or, or misguided. And it's important to point that out, but it's also important to point out that I don't think there's a whole lot of members of Congress who are going to be listening to that. What are the chances of these getting enacted? I think something is going to happen at some point. You know, I was a little bit surprised that the markets fell so precipitously on the introduction of the Biosecure Act because it's not imminent. It's not going to it's not going to be passed, you know, tomorrow or next week. There's some scenarios where you could see something happening as early as this spring, 
I wouldn't put money on that, but it's a possibility. More likely, we're looking at something, you know, year end or maybe beginning of, of next year, perhaps in a, um, in a defense appropriations bill or some other legislation that's kind of must pass legislation. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, I guess to be clear on the uh, the loss in market cap, it was really the two Wuxi companies that I mentioned that were hit the hardest. Uh, Wuxi Aptech shed more than twelve billion in market cap during that time frame. Wuxi Biologics uh, seven billion. MGI and BGI fared a bit better, around nine hundred million lost for MGI and and about three hundred and sixty million. For BGI, and and that probably reflects the fact that their exposure in the United States yeah. is less than yeah. and the other companies, because actually BGI is the one who's uh, the focus is is primarily on BGI. The other companies are brought into it, but and and that's where I think it's something that's worth remembering is that this legislation could change as it goes through Congress. I suspect that it will, in part because uh, there will be a concern that U.S. companies competitiveness will be hurt if they don't have access to the products and services of some of these companies. BGI is not in that category, but Wuxi uh, Biologics and Wuxi Aptech very well may be. All right. And what, what else is happening in Washington? Oh, well, we're going to have a big show here on Thursday. Bernie Sanders, the chairman of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, has demanded that the CEOs of three drug companies testify He's looking for a viral image on Thursday. He wants to have something like the CEOs of the tobacco companies raising their hands before they fail to own up to decades of lying about the dangers of cigarettes. I think there's a big difference. Merck, J&J, and Bristol Myers, those are the CEOs of those companies who are testifying, they make life-saving pharmaceuticals. And the, the ethical issues associated with drug pricing center on whether the companies have done everything they should to make their products accessible and they're going to be lambasted for arguing over whether the Inflation Reduction Act's Medicare drug price negotiation program is constitutional or if it will have unintended consequences. You know, I think that's very different from CEOs who go up to Congress and defend the marketing of addictive poison. And I think that it will be um, treated differently. Most people aren't going to tune into the second panel after the CEOs are on, but I'm actually looking forward to that. I think it's going to be interesting, especially. Darius Lakdawalla, Director of Research at the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics, is going to be testifying. He's an economist. He's published some really interesting papers advocating that CMS take a value-based approach to implementing the IRA, and then it used something called Generalized Risk Adjusted Cost Effectiveness, or GRACE, to assess value. That's an alternative to some of the cost-effectiveness measures that have been used by health technology assessment bodies in the United States and in Europe. All right. Thanks for that update, Steve. On Friday, we published a brilliant piece by our colleague, Danielle. She did her annual analysis of the emerging technologies behind companies raising Series A rounds, so focusing on the class of 2023. Uh, Selena, you were the editor on this piece. What did she find? Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, this was a multi-part project encourage anyone out there listening who's interested to check it out. Um, she looks at some of the statistics behind last year's Series A rounds, things like round sizes, frequency of financings across regions, how many of them were extensions, a lot of extensions last year, things like that. There's a section on the deals these companies have been able to struck, you know, among those who have, have struck deals, um, including pharma deals, the most active investors, things like that. But yeah, the, the heart of the deck really is an analysis of the technologies um, behind these companies. And Danielle identified um, certain clusters of technologies. So one of those, which won't be surprising, right, is there's half a dozen companies working on radiopharmaceuticals trying to take targeted radiotherapies you know, to the next level, solve various problems with that technology. Um, but maybe some less obvious kind of clustering of companies were around things like mitophagy induction and epigenome editing. So mitophagy is kind of an interesting one um, because it, it, what it means is, as the name would suggest, mitos for mitochondria, phagy, destruction of those mitochondria. It's a process whereby cells, you know, 
<clears throat> keep watch over what's going on with their mitochondria. And when they become dysfunctional, which can happen in disease or aging, they trigger destruction of them. And because all these biological processes have feedback loops and they exist in homeostasis, you then get the triggering of production of new, fresh, functional mitochondria. But because it's such a fundamental process across all cells, it has potentially a lot of different pharmacological applications. So just a small number last year, but there were three companies working on ways to induce mitophagy to bring it back when it's dysfunctional. They're early stage, they haven't disclosed their targets, but it's really an outgrowth of something that's just getting started. And there have been a few before them that have disclosed targets. So there's this company, Mission Therapeutics, um, is trying to um, restore mitophagy via a inhibition of a deubiquitinase that's associated with the mitochondria. It's called USP30. And there's at least one pharma that's getting into the space, exploring mitophagy. Um, Avi acquired uh, a company called Mitokinin in October. Mitokinin's lead candidate is a pink one activator. So you've heard of pink one before. It's probably in the context of Parkinson's disease because there's a gen genetic link there. But several of the genes involved in Parkinson's have been linked to mitochondrial dysfunction over the years. Um, and pink one has a role in turnover of dysfunctional mitochondria. So it kind of fits this narrative of mitophagy induction and we'll see where that one goes. Yeah, I mean, this is a really impressive analysis. I encourage people to dive in and, and sit quietly with it for a little while. It does one of the things that, you know, Danielle and her and her group and that that part of our editorial team really focus on, which is to look at the emerging science and how that is being converted into either therapies or drug development solutions is what I would say. That's what I would call a delivery vehicle, for example. And there's there's some really very interesting science behind a lot of these. Obviously, you know, she looks for trends here in what you've talked about, the sort of technology clusters, as you call it. But she also outlines what are the A rounds of $100 million or more, and who are the investors in those. And um, I just sort of think that what, what was interesting, she identified like 11 biotechs that raised a series A rounds of a hundred million or more last year when, you know, it wasn't that easy to raise money um, for a new co. And, you know, they weren't, there were a few of them that were sort of a phase one or phase two, but there's still a bunch of preclinical companies and uh, platform technology companies in there. And then, you know, one of the other features that was interesting, especially as we start the path to our conferences, we have our Asia conference in East West conference in Singapore. And in May, we're going to have our bioequity conference in Europe. And actually last year, so Danielle carved up geographically and the number of series A rounds in the US was sort of sharp drop off from in 2023 was a sharp drop off from 2022 in the Americas, but in Asia and Europe, it actually didn't drop off from the previous years. So while the actual amount of activity is less than in the US, the difference shrunk a lot actually. And so uh, Asia and Europe both saw increased numbers of series A rounds in 2023 over 2022. So yeah, there's a little bit in here for everybody. It, it's pretty interesting. And our Asia conference, uh, right around the corner, you can go to biocenturyeastwest.com to learn more. And also on biocentury.com, the path to precision neuropsychiatry. That's Selena's Q&A with J&J's neuroscience head, Bill Martin. And we have, of course, multiple stories from Steve on the IRA, including how the IRA disincentivizes new indications and how to fix it. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next week. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. <laughs>